Good evening. You are a beautiful sight, I must say. I'm Martin Copenhaver, president of Andover Newton Theological School. We are so glad you're here. Uh, so impressed that you came in this weather, and I know you'll be glad you did. We're here in celebration of Circle. We're here to Ibu, hear Ibu Patel, who's just been inspiring us left and right here in his time on this campus this afternoon, and you really have a treat in store for you. Today I was uh, remembering that Martin Luther King Jr. in a sermon cited an author who died with just a few scraps of story ideas that were discovered after his death. And one of the story ideas was this fragment, that in a large and diverse family that has been scattered inherits a house. And they have to learn how to live in that house together. The author never wrote the story. So it's very provocative to sort of picture how that story might end. And in fact, right now, it seems like the world is trying to figure out how to write that story. Dr. King went on to be very specific about people of different races and nationalities and religions. In that house, that inherited house, that family included uh, Jews and Christians and Muslims. And how are they to live together with the cycle of their days, with their different prayer practices, with their common devotions and their different perspectives? And it seems to me that here on this hill, at Andover Newton and Hebrew College and Rabbinical School, we're, we're doing our own small part in writing that story of how do we live in that inherited house in this diverse family. And we're very encouraged and inspired by the steps that have been taken and also eager to see what is ahead for us. And so, Ibu, we're really grateful that you're here uh, to challenge us, uh, to inspire us, to help us think about what it is that we can do uh, to live in this, this beautiful house that we have all inherited. So I would like to uh, turn to my friend and colleague, uh, Danny Lehman, president of, of Hebrew College Rabbinical School, uh, to offer your own words of welcome. We're so glad you're here, as always. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Hebrew College is um, very proud to be a partner with Andover Newton in this venture of Circle, uh, and more generally, I think, in the shared work that we do every day in transforming religious leadership. And that's really what we're here to think about. Um, this is about interreligious leadership education, which has an aim. And the aim is to actually transform what it means to be religious and what it means to be a leader in a pluralistic world. And we're here to think about that together. And again, I want to add my words of welcome because um, to be in this space with this diverse group participating in this conversation. And I want to point out, to Andrew over Newton's credit, this space, this Wilson Chapel, was built very much for these kinds of gatherings because as much as it is a worship space, it's also a space that was very sensitive uh, to the requirements of interreligious gatherings. And you'll sense the meeting house nature, I've heard this uh, described many times, and the lack of overt religious uh, symbols that allow us to come together comfortably um, in a space which is both inspiring, uh, but also one in which uh, we can feel at home. So I want to thank Andover Newton for both building that space and creating that environment in partnership with us on this hill. Um, and I want to thank Ibu Patel for spending 
uh, the afternoon with us. We've had several conversations. This evening's talk is really the culmination. And uh, Ibu is really an important source of stimulation for our work. Um, he represents an important uh, element of the, the leadership of a movement in interreligious leadership, and we very much appreciate the ongoing conversation and the fact that he's such a consistent and committed thought partner uh, to the leadership of Circle and to uh, both of our institutions in this very sacred work. And I just want to close with um, with one quote from a, a somewhat um, surprising source, and that is Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, who was an important uh, Jewish thinker and Talmudist who uh, lived here uh, in Brookline, just a few miles from here for most of his life. Um, and he was not a great supporter of interreligious engagement, frankly, although um, he quoted people from across the religious spectrum often in his writing. And in one particular work, he has a sentence which I just want to leave you with as a, an image. The sentence is this, the white light of divinity is always refracted through reality's dome of many colored glass. The last part of that, the dome of many colored glass, is actually a quote from Percy Shelley in his poem Adonai, an elegy to John Keats. Um, and he quotes it without actually footnoting where it's from, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, but I'm revealing that to you. And I think the whole notion that we live in this dome of many colored glass, and the question is, what are we going to do with that refracted light? Are we going to only view it from the particular color that is our tradition? Or are we going to learn how to see that light through the kaleidoscope of colors um, that we are privileged in this country in particular uh, to engage. And I think this gathering, all of you, and um, the thoughts and words of Ibu Patel that we're about to hear are going to allow us to expand the colors with which we see the religious world. So welcome and thank you, and I'm going to turn it over to our circle leadership. Good evening, everyone. I'm Celine Ibrahim Lizio. I'm the, the third co-director of Circle, as it were. We welcome you here tonight again. We just wanted to run through very quickly a little bit of what Circle does. So as you've, you've seen, if you've been here with us for a while, that we're taking full advantage of this relationship of proximity that is so unique to who we are. And although I've been here less than a year, this is uh, an ongoing project that has spanned over a decade now. So in addition to our academic programs, we try to enrich the, the community of which we are a part, including uh, welcoming you all here tonight to this lecture. So part of, part of what we're doing is educating religious leaders and educating religious leaders in conversation with one another through our, our joint academic courses that run the gamut between pastoral skills, uh, social justice initiatives, text study, and really a whole gamut, we're thinking very holistically about what it means to be a religious leader and what type of skills are needed in these contexts. In addition to working with the student population, we have on the Hill here a, a wonderfully vibrant initiative of which some of you here are a part of our adult education series that's geared for both uh, civic leaders, lay leaders, uh, people who have very little religious background who want to be drawn into these conversations through our adult learning series. So among us today are our wonderful Circle Fellows who engage in different types of entrepreneurial projects in the community in which they can put their academic training into practical experience and then reflect back on that in a, in a shared community cohort. Uh, we're very excited that the program is in its seventh year and every year we wel welcome in approximately 12 fellows. So we now have alumni serving really nationally, internationally, who part as part of their religious formation have been deeply engaged with the religious other. 
as a part of, of the, the peer, uh, the, the fellowship projects, we have peer groups, and the peer groups are a way for the fellows themselves to invite in a larger conversation. If you're interested in, in, in what that means to be part of a peer group, some of them are, are entirely theological students, others are open to the wider community, and this is a way uh, to both foster leadership and to have our students already giving back to the communities in which we're a part. Uh, yeah, I'm Jennifer Peace, and I have the privilege of co-directing with Orr and Celine. Um, one of the wonderful additions to our fellowship program has been Muslim Community Fellows. This year, as it happens, six out of our 12 fellows are Muslim Community Fellows, and that's been incredibly enriching. Publications. Oh, I love this one. So um, Circle has the privilege of housing two amazing publications, the Journal of Interreligious Studies, which is a scholarly peer-reviewed journal, the largest of its kind that we know of, <laughs> and the State of Formation, which is this wonderful, vibrant blog online site. 250 student participants in that, in some form of formation, uh, religious, ethical, leadership formation. Actually, Ben uh, co-directs that site. He's sitting right here if you have any questions. We're always looking for new scholars. And these are two wonderful ways that we can extend what we're doing on the Hill to a national kind of conversation. Hi, my name is Orr Rose, and uh as you can guess, I work with these two fantastic folks. Uh, behind me is a slide featuring a book that we published a few years ago called My Neighbor's Faith, and it grew out of a conference that we jointly hosted between Andover Newton and Hebrew College on the state of interreligious education in seminaries, divinity schools, and other training programs for religious leaders. And what we found was that the most interesting part of that conference were the stories that people told, stories of transformation, stories of challenge, stories of opening. And so, uh, much to our delight, the book has been widely used uh, in universities, colleges, and uh, in graduate programs. And it's available for sale along with Ethan's books. <laughs> <laughs> so it's our, our great delight to be celebrating some of our new initiatives tonight. Uh, which includes the uh, inauguration or soon to be inauguration of the Circle House, which is an experiment in interreligious living and, and working. It will also house a multi uh, religious, multi faith library. And it, our, our idea is that as it sits in between the two campuses, that it will be a physical location to represent much of the work that Circle has been doing for years. So stay tuned when we officially have the inauguration and for tours, and, and we hope to bring you back maybe when it's not freezing cold and uh, raining. Uh, so this is a new initiative. We're just starting to, to roll it out. Keep posted for more details on this. And uh, we, we also appreciate any input if you're a person in the room who's thinking about doing a, a degree in, in interfaith leadership and global interfaith leadership. Uh, we're convening these conversations. So what makes this all possible? I think I'll turn this. I get to do the money part. No, just a quick word, just to say that we have these wonderful fellows and we are trying to establish endowed fellowships for them. We're trying to endow 12. We have two out of the 12 already. We're thrilled about that. We would love all 12 here tonight. No, so um, just there's many ways for you to be involved on many levels and this is one of them. So once again, we'd like to thank the, the Henry Luce Foundation for making much of this work possible and for uh, the continued support of our programs. In addition to the Henry Luce Foundation, we also have other, other partners in, that fund different parts of, of the Circle Enterprise. And of course, there's always the, the contributions from our community partners that, that make the work sustainable. So thank you so much tonight, and we on with the show. For our next act, I have the privilege this evening of introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Ibu Patel. Ibu is, uh, without exaggeration, one of the most significant 
religious and interreligious leaders in the United States today. Over the last decade, he's been a pioneering figure in the growth of the field of interreligious studies and a significant contributor to the growing movement for interreligious cooperation. IFYC is one of the largest and most impactful organizations on the interfaith scene. Among Ibu's many accomplishments, he's not only founder and president of IFYC, he served on President Obama's inaugural faith council and through that work established a very significant project called the President's Challenge in which hundreds of college campuses are now involved in intentional interreligious work across the country. In addition, Ibu is a Rhodes Scholar and uh, he's a recipient of the prestigious prize for writing from the Grahmeyer Foundation for his first of two books, Faith Acts, or Acts of Faith. I always confuse the title. <laughs> the second is called Sacred Ground and both are for sale following uh, the lecture. And uh, I just want to add a personal note uh, I met Ibu almost 10 years ago. I read his first book and was deeply moved by it. I was just mucking around on this hilltop with Greg Mobley and a few others, trying to sort out what it might mean to create a substantive interfaith program. And I read this book. So given the chutzpah that I have, I called the IFYC office and I said, can I have a conversation with Ibu Patel? And one of the many young people in the office said, well, he's actually in Hartford today. Um, but you might want to go and have a cup of coffee with him because he really likes to drink coffee with people. So I made my way to Hartford and uh, we started a conversation and here we are 10 years later and as all of the other folks have said, Ibu has been a thought partner, an inspiration, a guide, an advocate and uh, thank you so much for this ongoing relationship. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All right, we're going to do interfaith leadership in four parts. Part one, Ruth Messenger, the president of American Jewish World Service, has a powerful story of interfaith leadership. Fresh out of a master's program in social work, Ruth accepted a position as the director of child welfare services in western Oklahoma. Her job was to build a foster care network for young people. She started going for walks around the various neighborhoods in her town to get to know the area better, pushing a stroller with her newborn inside. She noticed that many of the private residences were marked with religious signs, things like the Church of Jesus Christ who died for our sins. She knocked on doors and began conversations with the person who answered. She said that her job was to help vulnerable children, explain the challenges facing troubled youth in the area, said that her highest hope was to help those kids find loving homes. Based on the religious signs she had seen outside the house, it looked like the residence doubled as a place for worship and community gathering. Might they help? The most common response went something like this. Come back on Wednesday morning for our praise service and speak to the group. There seemed to be some kind of religious gathering taking place at one house church or another just about every day of the week and just about every hour of the day. Ruth sat through countless sermons, praise songs and altar calls. As promised, the preacher would give her a chance to speak. She would rise and tell stories of local children and teenagers in need. When she was done, the preacher would quote scripture and say to the gathered worshipers, who here will answer the call of God and serve as loving families for these young people? People would literally line up to help, Ruth said. It was amazing to witness those evangelical house churches built the child welfare network in western Oklahoma. Things were far from easy for Ruth. Part of this was because she was Jewish. One time, she was invited to a Sunday morning service at one of the brick churches in town. It turned out to be Palm Sunday, and the pastor gave a fiery sermon on how Jews killed Jesus. Ruth used it as an opportunity for education. She invited the pastor over to her home for tea, informed him that not only was he factually wrong, but that she was Jewish and felt deeply insulted by, her ser by his sermon. Moreover, America, the country that he loved, was growing increasingly religiously diverse and his language was sure to cause division. 
And then Ruth pointed out a powerful area of commonality between her faith and his. Jesus was Jewish. Instead of preaching insulting and divisive falsehoods, why not focus on how the actions of Jesus inspired both Jews and Christians to serve others? Just as Ruth helped the Christians she worked with understand Judaism, so she developed a deeper appreciation for evangelical Christianity during her time in western Oklahoma. She was especially struck by the ethic of service in the community. They preached that God meant for us to serve others, and they practiced what they preached, she told me. When the pastor asked for volunteers and quoted scripture, people lined up. The 1960s were a tumultuous time. The anti-Vietnam War protests, the women's movement, the counterculture. Ruth Messenger and those evangelicals in western Oklahoma lined up on different sides of most of those major issues. Ruth was, after all, a liberal New York Jewish woman with a graduate degree who found herself in Oklahoma because her husband was fleeing the Vietnam War. Every single one of those identities marked an area of difference and disagreement with most of her evangelical partners. And yet, Ruth identified a powerful point of contact between their evangelical Christian values and her Jewish values. Because of that, Hundreds of mostly Native American young people in western Oklahoma lived in loving families rather than derelict orphanages. Ruth's story exemplifies interfaith leadership. I define an interfaith leader as someone who builds bridges of understanding and cooperation between individuals and communities who orient around religion differently. Ruth sought connection rather than division. When she saw signs like Church of Jesus Christ who died for our sins outside of people's homes, her dominant instinct was not, I disagree with that understanding of Jesus, therefore I am staying away from that house. Instead, she thought to herself, that is clearly a place where people gather and a leader lives. I will certainly have differences and disagreements with them, but we will also have some deeply held values in common. I will work to advance those shared values in a way that inspires all of us to create a foster care network for young people. It is one thing to seek connection. It is another thing to have the skills to successfully connect. Ruth embodied both. She found ways to speak to and mobilize a different religious community for a common cause. She learned to build trust with the pastor. She learned to earn goodwill by paying, a t- by paying personal visits to house churches and spending time with the community. She even learned that being a new mother with a little baby provided an initial point of contact. Ruth had significant disagreements with her evangelical partners. She did not agree with them about their doctrine of Jesus as Lord and Savior. She didn't, or their support for the Vietnam War, or their dim view of feminism. Ruth did not attempt to erase those disagreements, nor did she let the disagreements prevent her from partnering with those evangelicals on finding foster homes. When the disagreement crossed the line into insult, she addressed the situation head on, as with the Palm Sunday sermon. Crucially, she used the situation as an opportunity to educate her interlocutor, not simply scold him. Her method of education was to highlight something shared between their different traditions, that Jesus was Jewish. Even as Ruth was educating those around her about Judaism, her own knowledge about and appreciation for evangelical Christians grew. She admired their strong sense of community, their deep belief in God, and most of all, that they preached the importance of service and they practiced what they preached. This is what I call civic interfaith leadership in a diverse democracy. Its purview is the religious diversity that is found in neighborhoods, schools, parks, college campuses, companies, organizations, grocery stores, libraries, little leagues, hospitals, and similar spaces where citizens who orient around religion differently interact with one another with varying degrees of ignorance and understanding, tension and cooperation, division and connection. There are at least five things at stake in civic interfaith leadership, five civic goods that interfaith leaders help secure. Number one, reducing prejudice and increasing cooperation, increasing understanding. Number two, strengthening social cohesion. Number three, building social capital. 
Number four, fostering the continuity of diverse identity communities. Number five, facilitating the sacred project of relationships between diverse people. Ruth's story illustrates each of the above to varying degrees. Here are some other examples. When the Westboro Baptist Church came to Stanford University waving signs that said God hates fags and saying ugly things about Jews and other people, Ansaf Karim, a Muslim, and Anand Venkat Krishnan, a Hindu, organized a thousand-person strong celebration of Stanford's pluralism, complete with music and theater performed by students from all walks of life to tell the West Westboro folks how Stanford viewed its diversity. When a terrible earthquake hit Haiti in January 2010, Greg Damhorst worked with a diverse range of faith communities in his college town to package over one million nutritious meals for affected Haitians. Over 5,000 people participated from dozens of faith and philosophical communities, writing on butcher paper lines from their diverse traditions that inspired them to serve others. When a sick man was killed in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 because someone mistook him for a Muslim, Valerie Kaur took her camera and went across the country to collect people's stories of experiencing and overcoming discrimination in 9-11 America and forming inspiring connections even in the shadow of prejudice. She stitched these stories together into a film called Divided We Fall and screened it on dozens of campuses and in communities across the country to help people tell their stories of experiencing religious prejudice and building relationships across difference. Two, interfaith leadership is best viewed as a subfield in formation. Part of the fun and frustration of being in these early stages is hearing the dizzying number of ways that the term is used. Here are some more colorful examples from my own experience. At a meeting with highly respected religious leaders, I rattle off the diverse identity groups involved in interfaith youth core programs. When I get to secular humanists, somebody stops me and says, wait, did you just say that you've got people who don't believe in God involved in your organization? Isn't the purpose of interfaith work for believers to unite against non-believers, especially now in an era of advancing secularism? In the question and answer session of a speech I am giving at a small college in the Midwest, a young woman stands up and says, how long do you think it will take interfaith work to achieve its goal of a post-religious society? At a dinner with progressive Christians in New York City, someone comments that the political alliance, alliance between Jews and evangelicals regarding Israel is fascinating. The face of one of the dinner guests grows dark and stormy, and she exclaims angrily, an alliance dedicated to injustice can never be truly interfaith. At the benefit event for a significant Jewish institution in Chicago, I am introduced to someone as a person who builds interfaith cooperation on college campuses. She says, oh, so you're doing the good work of stopping the bigots running campus anti-Israel campaigns. After a talk at a progressive church in Portland, a woman stands up, folds her hands in a form of prayer, and asks, at what point in your interfaith journey did you learn that all religions were true and one? When do you share this wisdom with others? In a conversation with a Muslim at a conference on Islam, he says to me, when during your interfaith work do you invite people into the right religion, Islam? During a session with campus leaders at a public university in Utah where the population is 85% Mormon or Latter-day Saints, someone suggests an idea for an interfaith program. Returned Mormon missionaries should give presentations about their missions to religiously diverse audiences in addition to Mormon-only settings. This way, the capital T truth will be heard by diverse people. Right after this person speaks, a woman stands up and says she loves interfaith work because it recognizes that there is no such thing as capital T truth, only many small t truths. You will notice people on both sides of various divides see interfaith work as a vehicle for their own particular theology and politics. When pro-Israel folks hear the term interfaith, they think support for Israel. When critics of Israel hear interfaith, they think criticism of Israel. Committed theists who are concerned with the rise of the numbers of non-religious want interfaith to be about believers uniting to defeat non-believers. Non-believers who are concerned with the influence of religious voices often want interfaith to be the opposite. In my view, none of the above defines the purpose of interfaith work, but taken together, they illuminate the field 
upon which interfaith leaders play, a field which may be called deep diversity. Shallow diversity thinks that difference is mostly about interesting ethnic foods. <laughs> some samosas here, some egg rolls there. If your palate is sophisticated, you like both. <laughs> Deep diversity is about conflicting ultimate concerns. People are ultimately concerned with the state of Israel and the Palestinian cause, whether there is a single capital T truth or many small t truths, whether belief in God leads to exaltation or to oppression. Religion is about fundamental things, ultimate concerns. Diversity is about people with different identities interacting with great frequency and intensity. Democracy is about having the freedom to express your views and participate in public life. In a religiously diverse democracy, especially one that accords a special place to faith, you have to expect deep disagreements on fundamental things. Interfaith leaders do their work in a public square of colliding ultimate concerns. They may be supporters of Israel or critics, pro-choice or pro-life, in favor of same-sex marriage or against it. But one ultimate concern an interfaith leader must have is a commitment to a healthy, religiously diverse democracy. The only way to have a healthy, religiously diverse democracy is for people who have deep disagreements on some fundamental things to be able to work together on other fundamental things. Creating a space for this ultimate concern to flourish is the task of the interfaith leader. Three, it has become standard operating procedure to say that interfaith leaders engage diversity to build pluralism. Diversity, as everyone in this room knows, according to Harvard's Diana Eck, who defines it simply as the fact of different identities and interaction. She says that the term diversity says nothing about the nature of those interactions, whether they are cooperative or whether they are a civil war. Pluralism is the proactive engagement of diverse identities towards a positive end. When I say healthy, religiously diverse democracy, I mean one that is characterized by pluralism. But it is not enough to say that diversity is about the fact of difference in close quarters, and pluralism is about the positive engagement of that diversity. What type of diversity ought interfaith leaders be most concerned with? And what does engaging it positively mean? I'd like to agree with the basic arc of the definition, move diversity to pluralism, but add more flesh to the bones of the operative terms. Let's start with defining religious diversity. There's a temptation to reach for one of two poles. The first is to extrapolate from Will Herberg's famous Catholic Protestant Jew typology from the 1950s. This view recognizes that many more religious expressions are now represented in the United States and effectively takes religious diversity to mean Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, etc. The second view is articulated best in Robert Bella's famous example of Shilaism from Habits of the Heart. This position understands every individual as a sect unto herself. The problem with the Herbergian view, Herbergian view, for the graduate school educated amongst you, <laughs> is that world religion categories, Catholic, Muslim, Hindu, etc., are not the only differences that matter in contemporary religious diversity. Maybe not even the differences that matter most. The problem with the second view, the Shilaism view, is that it pretends that there are no communal patterns at all, just 320 million different Shilaisms. For interfaith leaders, I think the term religious diversity has to obviously include the distinctions between quote-unquote world religions and has to make room for individual interpretations or relationships with each tradition, but ought to also include the following three dimensions. Number one, the recognition that 20% of Americans check none on religious identity surveys. And amongst millennials, the number is 33%. Some of these people are spiritual seekers, others are ardent atheists, many call themselves secular humanists. What they have in common is a feeling of being disconnected from traditional religious categories. 
I think it is still useful to retain those categories, Muslim, Christian, Jew, Hindu, etc., in no small part because such categories have long histories, concrete institutions, and large groups of people who still identify with them. But the interfaith tent has to create equal space for and better understanding about those who fall outside such categories. Number two, intrafaith diversity, especially of the theological kind. Within Christianity, there are, Catholic, there are Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox. Within Protestants, there are mainline and evangelical. Within mainline, there are Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Methodists, ELCA Lutherans, members of the United Church of Christ. There are different takes as to whether Mormons and Quakers belong to the Christian tradition. And there is a similar story in just about every religion. Bottom line, it is far too simplistic to only see Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, etc. Interfaith leaders especially have to be attuned to the various theological communities within each tradition. Third, intersectional identity. Nobody is defined entirely by his or her religious identity. Even if religion is highly salient, it is always intersecting with other identities, race, class, gender, geography, politics, ethnicity, nationality, sexuality. <clears throat> interfaith leaders have to recognize how intersecting identities influence patterns of being, believing, and belonging. Consider all the various identities that made up Ruth Messenger in the 1960s. White, female, Jewish, graduate school educated, New Yorker, social worker, politically liberal, raised in a financially comfortable environment. Think also of the various identities of Ruth's partners. Certainly, their evangelical Christian faith was a primary identity, but their location in western Oklahoma no doubt had something to do with their response to Ruth's overtures, and the fact that their class status meant they lived in houses gave them the privilege to offer up those houses as homes. So, if the religious nuns, if theological differences, and if intersecting identities are part of the landscape of religious diversity, how should we understand the destination that interfaith leaders are driving towards? What is a deeper definition of pluralism? I'd like to offer a three-part definition. <clears throat> Respect for identity, relationships between different communities, and a commitment to the common good. Yes, my graduate school baggage in sociology is glaring at this point, I get it. Everything is a typology. Number one, respect for identity. <clears throat> respect for identity itself has three parts. The first is that people have a right to form their own identities regarding religion, or frankly, anything else for that matter. They can be believers or non-believers, Christians or Muslims, Sufis or Salafis. Moreover, they can be pro-gay marriage black feminist Christians or anti-gay marriage black feminist Christians. Second, people have a right to express their identity. They can pass out flyers about their belief system at the bus stop. They can form civic associations that nurture their patterns of believing, behaving, and belonging. They can seek to influence politics, voting for particular candidates, raising money for certain causes, running for office themselves, in the direction of their identity-based views. The third part of respect for identity is that people's identities should be reasonably accommodated. This means everything from there being reasonable facilities for the practice of one's identity to there being reasonable education about the diversity of identities within a society. As the explanation above suggests, by respect for identity, I do not mean agreement. If anything, respect for identity sets the stage for argument, tension, and conflict. In a diverse society, if people have the right to form their own identities and express those identities, those various identity expressions are going to find themselves disagreeing, as indeed they do in our own diverse society. While agreement is not the goal, I do hope that respect for identity engenders a sense of appreciation of different identities, even opposing viewpoints. Appreciation that goes something like this. I disagree with your view on abortion, but I have an appreciation for how your religious identity brings you to that view. Relationships between different communities. If the only virtue in a diverse society is respect for identity, we are in danger of imagining a nation where people have their most substantive conversations only within their identity circles. They interact with people of other identities only when there is a serious disagreement, waving opposing signs at each other while waiting for a Supreme Court verdict, or when they must, as in a business transaction. 
This is the definition of tribalism, and it is a recipe for civil war. Even short of civil war, it is not a particularly inspiring vision of a diverse society. That is one reason that relationships between diverse communities is a second key principle of pluralism. I use the word relationship to highlight that these are not connections based on agreement, but connections in full awareness that there are areas of both commonality and difference and a commitment to care for one another in full recognition of both. Commitment to the common good. By common good, I mean the principles and structures of the broader entities we all live within. Committing to the common good means recognizing that our various identity expressions and range of relationships can only exist when those principles and structures are healthy and upheld. This refers to both highly concrete and extremely abstract matters. If the principle of free expression is eroded, all of our identities are threatened. If violent gangs roam the streets, going to a PTA meeting where relationships between people who have different views in the Middle East can be built is more difficult. Simply put, the common good are those principles and structures that people generally agree we have a common interest in upholding. Of course, this is all made more complicated by the fact that people's identities shape their vision of the common good. People in favor of gay marriage speak about upholding the common good values of equal rights, dignity, and freedom. People opposed to gay marriage speak of the common good value of how marriage has been understood and practiced in Western civilization for millennia. But both views exist within a broader political community that allows free expression, civic and political associations, and has an accessible legal system, at least for most. Moreover, we live in a society with safe air travel, well-paved roads, and excellent communication systems. Bottom line, all identity communities have a stake in maintaining the health of some understanding of the common good. The bridged social capital generated through these relationships across diverse communities plays a key role in upholding all of these. Four, interfaith leadership is about the glories of diverse democracy in the abstract and the practices of diverse democracy in the concrete. Interfaith leaders need a vision, a knowledge base, and a skill set to do their work well. That is what I love about the CIRCLE program and the partnership between Andover Newton and Hebrew College. It endeavors to provide young people all of these things in a supportive community under the guidance of the best teachers in the country. Think about the relevance of this for our society. If you are a medical professional working in a setting where Catholic and Jain doctors regularly cooperate to save the lives of everyone from atheists to Zoroastrians, you might want to consider how interfaith leadership skills can help you tell that inspiring story to a wider community. If you coach a little league team with Muslim and Jewish players and we go through another period of high profile conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, you may well witness how fast tensions from the Middle East travel to the American East Coast. A conversation with your players about how building bonds of cooperation between Jews and Muslims over here provides an alternative possibility to the warring sides over there may prove useful, even necessary. To even think about having that conversation, you're going to need a framework for interfaith leadership. If you are a public school science teacher and you have a Sikh student in your class who wears a turban, you might want to pull him aside if there is another hate crime like the murders at the Sikh Gurdwara in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. You will want to let him know that you appreciate his commitment to his tradition and that you have some sense of how he might be feeling at that time. If he needs someone to sit with and talk to, you are there. To do that, you are going to need some of the knowledge base of interfaith leadership. If you are an active citizen and a community volunteer in an American suburb and the mayor asks you to pull together a thousand people for a major blood drive, you will no doubt want to tap into the networks of local faith communities. And once you've got them together at an event they feel is an expression of their various faith commitments to serve others, you might want to use the opportunity to organize an interfaith discussion and have them share stories about how their faith inspires them to help others. To pull that off, you're going to need the skill set of interfaith leadership. Ultimately, interfaith leaders help us achieve what the radio host Norman Corwin stated about diverse democracy. Post-proof that brotherhood is not so wild a dream that those who profit by postponing it pretend. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Ibu. That was really stimulating. My brain is sort of doing this little gear shifting thing in my head as I think about questions. Um, this is the time in our evening that we want to open the conversation to you all for some questions and answers. We have about 20 minutes and then you're free to, if you have books and you want Ibu to sign them or to talk more informally, we'll have a chance for that. So I'm happy to take the mic around. I don't know if that's actually true. Is, do we have a mic that's transportable? Um, and so think about, if you have a question, put up your hand. The way we'll do this is I'll take three or four questions all at once and then ask Ibu to think about how he wants to respond or, uh, together. Okay, so who has, a, who has a question they want to raise? Oh, there's lots of food for thought in there. I, some of you are my students. I expect you to have questions. <laughs> yes, please. I have a question. Oh, I have a question. So uh, recently in a, a pastoral care class, we had two uh, clergy members, one from Newtown, Connecticut, and one who had been at the site of the Marathon bombings, speak about um, their pastoral work in the wake of disaster. And one of the things that they said, both of them said very clearly, was that the interfaith work that they had done in the years before served them so well in being able to do the work that was needed in the wake of that. And so I'd love to hear more about that. All right, let's take a couple more. Who else has a question they want to pose? Yes, over here. So if, if for those who couldn't hear, the distinction between church and state and its impact on doing interfaith work in sort of middle school uh, educational settings. All right, let's take one more question. These are each very rich. Hello, you mentioned all these great things that the interfaith movement is doing. Can you tell me what is it that in broad sense the interfaith movement is getting wrong that no one is aware of? And what's the next major breakthrough going to be? All right, Ibu, three easy questions for you to tackle. <laughs> OK, uh, all of these are interesting. I'll start with the most straightforward, which is the middle school question vis-a-vis -vis church and state. So, so just as a, uh, th there's, there are many complications to that, but the way you asked it is, do, do church-state issues prevent the teaching about religious diversity in public school settings? And the easy answer to that is no. In fact, this is a Supreme Court case from the 1960s. It's, I think it's the Abingdon case. It's, it's easily findable, but uh, uh, one of the opinions, I don't, know if it, I don't know if it was a concurring one or the dominant one, but the, the, the Supreme Court justice who wrote it said that, that teaching about religion, not the teaching of religion, right? Not the confessional teaching of religion, uh, that's what my kids get in Catholic school uh, as a Muslim. Um, but teaching about religion um, is not only legal, but it's, it's a virtue for, for a religiously diverse society. So yes, you can do it. Is it, is it challenging and fraught? Absolutely. Um, uh, Diane Moore at Harvard Divinity School is probably the national expert on this. This is precisely what she does. She has a whole project on, on uh, interfaith education in secondary schools. And uh, Charles Haynes has a great little pamphlet on an, exp Charles Haynes is with the First Amendment Center. I'm a total geek about this stuff. So like I literally have literature reviews in my head. But Charles Haynes of the First Amendment Center has a little pamphlet on an experiment done uh, in Modesto, California, precisely on this, the teaching about different religions in public public schools. Um, I mean, I, I find your your example uh, very emotionally resonant. Thank you for that. Um, and I, so, so I recent there was a. Um, uh, I'm going to get some of the details wrong because I I, I just met the the uh, the author of a book called The Monks of Tiberine, which are about a, a group of of uh, of Catholic monks uh, who during uh, uh, I think the Algerian Civil War or one particularly uh, violent time in Algeria chose to stay where they were knowing that they would get killed in the process right and and a bishop connected to that community has uh, when people said you know how come you are interested in protecting the Muslims and in and not just the Catholics and his line uh, the author told me this directly uh, uh, stayed with me uh, uh, he said that if you only care about your community you are the head of a sect you are not a religious leader 
Right? If you only care about your community, you are the head of a sect, you're not a religious leader. Right? That's powerful, right? Uh, um, and if you decide that you care about other communities, well then you have, there are next steps that follow that. And a big part of those next steps is the ability to, to provide pastoral care. Right? You, have to un you have to know what that might mean to Muslims and Jews and Sikhs and Jains and Buddhists and Evangelicals and Catholics and non-believers. And you know, one of our friends, Yehuda Sarna, who's a rabbi at New York University and is, is actually part of a degree program there, a minor in interfaith studies at NYU, the first one at a major research university that, that I know of. He, he, he says that his first most powerful interfaith experience was going with a senior rabbi to the area around 9-11 right after the terrorist attacks and basically ministering, offering pastoral care to those folks. And, and Yehuda had, in a way, the opposite realization of what your two colleagues had. He, he realized he didn't, he didn't know how to do this, but he had this very deep sense that he had to know. Right, that, that if, if, if a religious leader could not minister to a diverse group of people in their time of great need, then, then who was he? Right? And that, that begins Yehuda's journey to becoming who he is. He's an Orthodox rabbi. He works closely with the Muslim imam and the imam's, um, Imam Khalid Latif, the imam's wedding is on a Saturday. Yehuda is invited. Of course, he, it's, it's Shabbat. He walks 50 blocks in Manhattan in the rain to this wedding, right? And he's like, this, it starts on 9-11. It starts knowing that I didn't have the skills. I knew that I, I, knew that I, I, knew that I had to be there. I just didn't have the skills to offer these folks. Uh, what is the interfaith movement getting right? So I, I, I did not mean my talk as uh, um, a celebration of interfaith cooperation as it is. Doesn't mean I think it's doing badly. It just means that um, if you if you stood in a crowded train station and yelled the word interfaith, <laughs> nobody would stop. <laughs> right? Um, I mean, that's, a, that's kind of a it's kind of a serious thing, you know? Right? Like if you were to if you were to if you were standing in the middle of a train station and yell the word civil rights, folks would stop. They know what that is. If you were to stand in a crowded train station and yell the word environmentalism. People would stop, they know what that is, right? We are the choir. I use the metaphor positively. We have to learn how to sing at louder volumes and more beautifully. So I think there are two big things that interfaith work has to do now. One, it has to learn how to grow. Now, interestingly, it has grown from an, all, from an almost non-existent movement 15 years ago. It has grown rapidly, but still, it is still relatively so small, right? So it has to learn how to grow. It also has to have a clear sense of what the various things it hopes to do and to get better at them. So what this talk is, in a way, is my stake in the ground of what I think interfaith leadership ought to be doing. Interfaith leadership is about positive and proactive civic engagement in a religiously diverse society. It's about a healthy, religiously diverse democracy. A couple of hours ago, there was a spirited conversation uh, where people carved out a different, what I would say, quadrant in the territory. That interfaith leadership is primarily about communal religious leadership, understood broadly, not just in the pulpit, right, but communal religious leadership in a religiously diverse society. I find that a perfectly compelling view that I half agree with, right? But what we are doing is we're having a conversation about, I think, both growth and about definition. Right. And I mean, part of this is, look, I run an organization. So and, you know, people are like, we're a five, six million dollar interfaith organization. And we're probably the largest such organization working in North America. Right. And people are like, man, that's great. And I'm like, no, dude, it's terrible. <laughs> right. It's terrible that the largest nonprofit entity and I'm not talking about an institution of higher education. Right. I'm talking about standalone nonprofit entity working for interfaith cooperation in North America is $5 million. What's the largest human rights entity? What's its budget? What's the largest environmentalism, environmental organization? What's its budget, right? I mean, our, our, our movement 
relatively speaking, is very, very small. Right? So it has to grow. It has to have a clearer sense of what it hopes to do. And whatever that definition is for various you know, kind of seats around the table, there has to be a, the question of what does it mean to do this better? So this is what we do. How do we improve at it? Right? So, so this isn't a celebration of, of the interfaith movement. It is my particular vision for, for the role I think it plays or could play in a diverse democracy. Don't mean to be a downer, right? <laughs> Don't mean to be a downer. Uh, glad that I'm 39 and that I got 50 more years left in this, God willing. Sure. Recently, I was at an international symposium on contemplative studies here in Boston. And <clears throat> there were many um, practices that we were invited to. And so we did things like meditation, movement, chanting together interreligiously. And um, I also uh, participate in Spiritual Directors International, which does the same kind of shared practice. And academic institutions tend not to, interreligious work at academic institutions tends not to have shared practice. And I'm wondering if you could comment on the pros and cons. Yeah. So um, the single best approach to shared spiritual practice or shared worship I experienced about 75 minutes ago, and it was when Jenny... Uh, having known her for 15 years, I'm shocked that I've never witnessed this before, but she said, before the meal, will you join me in prayer or a spirit of prayer? Right, so, so that, if, if shared worship or prayer is an important part of your interfaith leadership, and I have great respect for that, then developing techniques like that, which is to say there are, there are some people around the table who will feel will feel able and inspired to participate fully in the practices of another tradition. There's other people who uh, will want to stand respectfully a foot outside the circle. There's other people who will need to leave the room, right? Um, so, I, but I, I, I think it's, I, my friend Sister Carol from Notre Dame College was at that conference uh, and, and crowing about it and actually went back to Notre Dame College, which is outside of Cleveland, and started and launched a course called Contemplative Practices Across Traditions. I mean, I view that as, you know, really interesting and inspiring and, and right at the sweet spot of kind of the faith dimension of interfaith work. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about what technique what practices you have found work best for uh, breaking out of the, the circle of usual suspects and reaching people who aren't out there seeking interfaith engagement, but who could benefit from it? Okay, we're gonna have some fun with this question, right? We're friends, right? We're gonna have some fun with this, okay. Um, so I've been spending a reasonable amount of time in Red America recently, uh, uh, and, I, and really honored by those invitations. And I got to tell you, you know, uh, Cardinal George was in Utah 18 months ago uh, giving a talk, uh, basically Catholics and Mormons together, right? Incidentally, one way to understand the Church of Le Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not an alternative vision of a Catholic church, but a contradictory and oppositional vision. Like effectively, the emergence of the LDS community is the idea that the Catholic church structured their magisterium incorrectly. Uh, Robbie George, a uh, well-known Catholic scholar at Princeton, and Sheikh Hamza Youssef, maybe two years ago, just did a major talk on their collective opposition to gay marriage, right? Uh, Albert Moeller, uh, the head of the, uh, Greg, <laughs> we're reaching out to people, my man. <laughs> Is it your turn? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just. I have to say, I've been doing this work a lot. I've never had somebody hiss in the audience. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Uh, Albert Moeller uh, goes to BYU and uh, gives a talk that says, 
uh, we are going different places after we die, but we should go to jail together over the violation of our religious freedom. Okay. Guess what? There is a robust interfaith movement on the other side of that wall. They just believe different things than you do. I mean, but welcome to religious diversity, right? So it is actually, if, if to not see that means we're friends, right? You're not looking over the wall, right? Because these are not like secrets, right? These are like major public addresses by major religious figures, right? Who incidentally are doing exactly what you do when you engage with uh, a, a progressive Muslim. You might, you choose to disagree on the notion of the prophethood of Muhammad and you agree on environmental concerns. What they are doing is choosing to disagree on the correct magisterium and agreeing instead on a particular view of same-sex marriage, right? They are doing exactly what you're doing, just their politics are different. Right? The reason I love Ruth Messenger's story is because everything about her was different than everything about them. But she had a focus. We are going to build a foster care network. And that's why this is about leadership. It was her leadership ability to keep that central and the ability to build a set of relationships towards that goal, to decide when something goes over the line of insult, I'm going to engage it. But otherwise, of course, these people are going to pray for my soul in church. That's who they are, right? Of course, these people are going to do an altar call and look at me. That's who they are, <laughs> right? I mean, like, people say to me, they're like, I went to this interfaith gathering, and I mean, I couldn't believe it. People disagree with me about God. And I'm like, what the hell do you think you were going to? <laughs> you know? But it is, it is actually surprising to me the number of people who go to interfaith stuff and expect similarity. <laughs> go to interfaith stuff expecting difference. And the work of leadership is identifying the commonality. And it's not hard work because the commonality is so hard to find. It's hard work because the fire of difference is so hot. What do you think interfaith leadership is for? Uh, so my question is, um, I, I'm, I'm uh, Reverend Sarah Napolina of the Unitarian Universalists, and, um, and we encounter the spiritual but not religious community a lot as kind of a curiosity and, and a community to reach out to. Um, and in this age where you said 33% of the millennial generation consider themselves nuns or not affiliated with a traditional religious community, as we are kind of moving away from traditional religious communities in that way, and a lot of people are identifying as completely not interested in that. How does that affect what you just described as a, an, an, a movement that needs to grow? Um, you were just talking about how the interfaith movement is this tiny little thing, only $5 million for this budget. You know, how, how can something that seems to be on some kind of a decline grow um, when it is, I, I believe it's something that's very much needed um, in this kind of dialogue, but how can I'm wondering if you could reflect on that a little bit. In the premise of your question is the idea that, that quote unquote religious nuns are not, are definitionally not a part of, of interfaith work. And I'm wondering why you've premised your question such. Um, not necessarily that they're not part of religious work. Interfaith work, yeah. Interf oh, interfaith work. Um, but that, um, but that it is, um, if it's not that, it, not, entirely, but that there is a growing community that is uninterested in religious, not necessarily the SBNRs, that, that, that there are some people who are st still deeply invested in interfaith work, but there are many people who are completely secular and have no interest in spirituality. Right. So, I th so uh, thank you for asking it with that, that additional clarity. So, so uh, that is a considerably smaller percentage of the population. You're now talking maybe single digits. Right. I mean, one of the interesting things about America, I mean, the great line by G.K. Chesterton is America is a nation with the soul of a church. Right. And one of the things about America and Robert Putnam, I'm just quoting him, he says, you know, even our atheists like to pray, you know, <laughs> and it's true. It's true. So. So, yes, 19 percent of Americans say uh, check none. 
and 33% of millennials check none. And there's no doubt that it's, that it's harder to engage people who do not organize themselves into particular entities. There's no doubt about that, right? But within those groups, people like Robbie Jones at Public Re Religion Research Institute have found that, that very small percentages are hostile to religion and not particularly high percentages are, are uninterested from religion totally. Right? They are not currently engaged in a community, and they're probably not particularly interested in being in a community, but there is a, there is a relatively significant percentage that is interested in God, interested in religion, tr religious tradition, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this, you know, if, if somebody were to say to me, you know, boil, boil this down to one line, my one line would be, it has to be inspiring, right? So what that means is like, it just it just can't be boring. I don't know how else to put it. I know that's like really third grade, but interfaith work has to be inspiring, right? Um, and what I say at interfaith leader, you know, the thing that the major thing that we run as far as student religious leadership training is uh, interfaith leadership institutes. And I would say, you know, of the 120 or so students to, that come to each one of those four, so you know, four to 500 total is what we will train a year. Probably a quarter are are nuns but who are interested in and friendly to issues of religious diversity. And basically I'm like, look, there's only a couple rules. You can't enter hostile, right? Like this is not the place to like tell us everything you hate about X. And the second thing is you have to be willing to be in a room where people are talking about religion as inspiring, right? You don't have to be religious. Nobody's gonna make you be religious, but people here are gonna talk about religion as inspiring and that's encouraged. And you gotta be able to be in a room with that. Uh, there was somebody who had, yes. Hi. Here and then here. Thank, yeah. thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm struck by the, your um, invocation of the term democracy. I don't expect it in this context. And, and I'm also struck by how I've never been, and I think many people may share this, I've never been more disappointed in our democracy in general. So, so I'm wondering whether you are forgive me for the personalization, but, but in this, your effort here is in some way taking, expecting too much from something that isn't meant or isn't able to overcome such an extraordinary um, dissonance in our, in our own society. Uh, I th thank you for that question. Um, so, if, it, Five, what I call the kind of five civic goods of interfaith leadership. Let me see if I can remember them, right, without looking back at my notes. Uh, reduce prejudice and increase understanding. Strengthen social cohesion. Grow social capital. Uh, um, facilitate the continuity of identity communities. And h hold up the holiness of relationship between diverse people. I, I'm saying those things collectively are at the center of what it means to have a religiously diverse democracy. Different people might say, and I'm saying I care about those things as a collective, which is why I frame this as democracy. Different people might say they care about one or the other especially. So Danny might say the thing that he cares about the most is the, identity of, is the continuity of identity communities and the holiness of relationships between different people, right? So he locates himself in a particular place there. I think that this is, this is about the enterprise of a diverse democracy. That's not that I, 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 you know, at different points in my life and at different times in the day, I care about things differently. I care about my kids not experiencing religious, religious prejudice in school, right? I care about uh, the continuity of, of uh, Ismaili Muslims as a religious community. I care about the beauty of friendships between people who disagree on just about everything right, and still stay friends. I think that that's holy. Um, and collectively, I'm calling that a diverse democracy. And I'm saying that, uh, that it, it's actually a, a hyper salient issue right now, not just in the United States, right, but also around the world. I mean, one way to think about this is that if we think the news in this country is about the challenges of having a religiously diverse democracy, just read the international section of the New York Times. Okay, a way to read that section, 
is this, that nations that were long, nations that have long been democracies, but were relatively homogenous, are now struggling with religious diversity, Europe. Nations that have long been diverse are now struggling with democracy, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, right? I think that a reasonable number of problems, of challenges around the world can be categorized in the struggle to have a religiously diverse democracy. And I think that contributing to the, I think the American project is in no small part about how to have a healthy religiously diverse democracy. And I, I mean, I just, I, I take that, that dimension of my identity, my American citizenship very, very seriously. And my life's work is effectively attempting to, to contribute something to the next chapter of America's religiously diverse democracy, mindful of the fact that it is more relevant than maybe ever around the world. Thank you. And that's the opposite of the hiss, my man. That's a... Either way, Greg, you are out front. So here I'm Miri the... Ronit, and I'm... Hey, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes, yes, here, and then we'll go to the left side of the room. Um, I'm Miri Ronit, and I'm a very proud IFYC alum, um, been involved for the last 10 years. And I guess my question is remembering sort of what IFYC was like when I started and how it skewed younger in terms of working with high school students. I'm wondering what you think of the possibilities for the movement to skew younger like that now yeah. since we're working mainly with college students and older folks now. So it's great to see you. Thank you for coming to this. Uh, I love running into IFYC alum. And you're right, you know, in 2004, 2005, when, when you were a central part of it, I mean, IFYC was literally 12 high school kids in a basement. You know, and if I had a basement, it would be my basement, but I was too poor to have a basement, right? So somebody else's basement. And so we've grown, and the vision has grown. Um, and I think that interfaith work at every level and place is hugely important. Uh, it just doesn't happen to be IFYC's focus right now, that's why we have alum like you, to go start interfaith high school programs. <laughs> so, um, uh, seriously, right? Like, I, I mean, I, I think good organizations have a focus and advance that focus for a good long time and get better and better and better at it, right? It's craft, right? And we have developed a craft in working with institutions of higher education, and that's something we want to get better and better and better at, and other people develop craft in other areas. So, okay, looking at the left side here. One, two, three, and I prefer four, and I will be, let's take them all. Yes, we'll, let's, so let's take all of these. Let's make them 30 to 45 seconds each, and I will answer the easiest question. <laughs> Go. So there's been a lot of stories recently about Generation X being the first generation born when social media was already a thing. And it seems like social media has the potential to make a kind of shallow diversity and shallow pluralism, but I'm wondering if you can think of some concrete ways that interfaith leaders are using social media uh, to do really good interfaith conversation and education. I lost trust in social media once like a dozen websites went up linking me to the Muslim Brotherhood. I'm like, I'm in a smiley Muslim from India with earrings in my ears. Trust me, the Muslim Brotherhood is not in interested in me. So I'll get back to your question in a more serious way in a second. Um, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Abdul Qadir Asmal, and I've been involved in interfaith work for more than 30 years, and I've enjoyed it immensely, and I've thought it to be very useful to reach out to people. But one of the thoughts that struck me after your presentation was um, perhaps the time for interfaith dialogue has come and passed. And the reason why I say this is based on the speech that Pope Francis made about two years ago addressed to the Muslim community. And the gist of his statement was respect. Respect for individuals, for their property, for their culture, and for their dignity. And if we can learn to respect 
each other's differences and allow for the fact that we are created different. We may have different religious beliefs, different ethnicities, different colors. We all are human beings. If we can learn to respect our differences, then I don't think we need to go through this artificial creation of interfaith dialogue because we respect each other regardless of whatever differences are. Somebody ask a different question so I'm not out of a job. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Mary Helen Gunn. My, my interfaith leadership formation began here in 2003. And one of the powerful teachings that I have carried with me is the struggle for what you've um, referred to in the context of intra-religious diversity. And I wonder if you could comment a bit on the training of leaders to bridge the, in some ways, more difficult divides between, shall we say, conservatives or orthodox within one tradition and liberals in one tradition, versus you know, where progressives across lines sometimes have an easier conversation, as well as orthodox across religious lines sometimes have an easier conversation than the intra-religious conversation from either end of those spectrums. If you could comment. Is there, Arif, did you have your hand up? Okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll take one more here and then I'll, uh, yes. Oh, the microphone is coming. Assalamu alaikum Ibu. So my name is Shaheen Akhtar and I've been doing for almost 20 years now. Um, I started two interfaith book groups and I think uh, interfaith work is very important. Uh, you gave definition of pluralism, um, but to me, this really, uh, I want to read it from your book, which um, you said, I thought about the meaning of pluralism in a world where the forces that seek to divide us are strong. I came to one conclusion. We have to save each other is the only way to save ourselves. Thank you so much. That's a good so line, much. huh? That's a good line. Yes. It's like my best line. Yes. Thank you. Yes. here with me we highlighted it and we have worked again and again and thank you so much thank you what a nice thing and you can see how many uh i see that i'm so yes. happy about that so, thank you thank you thank you um so i think so quickly on social media so quickly on on so let's say we build a world where where people respect each other more which would be a wonderful thing uh, in my geeky set of civic goods, that would be one, right? And so my own view of interfaith work is that it helps, it is, it, let's say we build a world without ugly prejudice and with better understanding of different people, with respect, as you say. Um, how do we grow social capital? How do we strengthen social cohesion? How do we ensure the the continuity of identity communities? How do we uh, uh, increase the, the holiness and sacredness of relationships across difference? And so I, I, my own view is that interfaith work is still very useful because it helps to do all of those other things. Um, uh, on the internet, um, I mean, we're losing, right? And I mean, it is, it's crazy to me like the amount of not just like random hate on the internet, but the amount of focused hate on the internet. And the amount of like, I will lure your 16 year old girl into being uh, a suicide bomber for uh, IS in Syria. It's, it's nuts, right? I mean, that set of folks has, is a master of that domain. You know, I don't know what else to say. Um, uh, um, it's not, it's not the area that where I naturally think. I mean, I'm I'm like a 20th century person. You know, like, you know, I I see people, I work with people in rooms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, but but clearly, there needs to be a much better strategy about advancing. I think uh, a robust and rigorous definition of interfaith cooperation online, right? Uh, and that is something that somebody else is going to have to start. Um, 
I guess my response to your question, which I think is a great question, um, is, is if we think, so the three dimensions of diversity that I talked about, right? Uh, in addition to world religions diversity, and in addition to the recognition that we all have some kind of individual or idiosyncratic relationship with the tradition, there's three additional dimensions that I think we ought to pay attention to. One uh, are the religious nuns, right? The second is intrafaith diversity, and the third is intersectional identities. So I guess what I'm saying is, I, this for me is an ingredient in the stew. It's not a separate thing, right? To, to, in, to do interfaith work is to, is to recognize that the diversity around the table is going to be Muslim and Hindu and atheist. It's gonna be Sufi and Shia and Salafi. It's going to be uh, um, a black, gay, evangelical and straight, white, atheist. It's going to be, you know, it's gonna be, all, that's religious diversity today. And so my own view would be what sorts of, differences and disagreements are likely to be salient given that mix of identities and just expect them, right? So, so to walk in and expect that people are not only going to disagree on salvation, they're going to disagree on Israel, they're going to disagree on gay marriage, they're going to disagree on abortion, they're going to disagree on immigration. Anything that you think is premise, somebody else will likely have a different premise on. And the challenge of interfaith leadership is to build a relationship anyway, which is harkening back to the Ruth Messenger story, right? Like literally, she's in Western Oklahoma because she and her husband are escaping the Vietnam War and are fleeing the Vietnam War. And the way her husband can get, get out of the draft is by being a doctor in a government facility. They try to get a position in Seattle and somehow he gets positioned in Tulsa instead. And they're like, well, I'd rather go to, to, to Tulsa than to Saigon. Right, and I just imagine like the hundred differences that this Jewish woman who graduates from Harvard and grows up in New York City has with these evangelical Christians in Western Oklahoma. And if she had not made the set of decisions to build a, rela a network of relationships, instead of saying, hey, I can't talk to folks who are sending, happily sending their kids to Vietnam, I can't talk to folks who think that feminism is, is like the, you know, is the devil come up to earth. I can't talk to people who think that women should not work, right? I mean, most of those people thought all of those things, right? And she worked, she found ways to work with them anyway. And, and I, I, you know, that is my definition of interfaith work, right? And, and, uh, to recognize that those are the disagreements we deal with and we have to find ways to have relationships anyway. So here's what I'll leave you all with. Um, probably everything that I said is a sociological concept, right? Uh, social cohesion, uh, social capital, identity communities, everything except the sacredness of diversity between diverse, the sacredness of relationships between diverse people. I consider that a central civic virtue. Right? I think it is beautiful. I rarely speak in this language, but I think it pleases God when people who have deep, deep disagreements have deep friendships also. I think that this work is sacred, right? And I think that those of us who do it and who have an, a spiritual orientation in that direction ought not give that up. I'm happy to speak in Ford Foundation language of social capital. You know, I believe in that stuff. I think it's a very good thing. I think it's a part of the American project. But I also think, right, that you know, from the Quran and also John Coltrane's saxophone, that there is something deeply, deeply holy to holding hands with someone and saying, I commit to you even though I disagree with you. Right? I commit to your safety, to your flourishing. I see your beauty and I disagree with you on just about everything. Right? That, that like spark of holiness, I think is so central to this work. And um, if people in seminaries and in religious settings are unwilling to speak that language and plant that flag, it'll disappear. Right? So, so we ought to be proud of that dimension. Thank you.
Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. I just want to thank the development teams both at Andover Newton and Hebrew College, Jennifer and Jan, and Danny and Martin, and everyone who's here tonight for all they did to make this possible. We have about a half an hour before they'll kick us out of this space, so feel free to stay and mill about and buy some books. Ibu will be available to sign them in the back out there. Um, and thanks again for being here. It was a wonderful conversation.